So um, uh, good morning and following Nick's talk yesterday, I also decided to give my talk in two parts. In the first part, I'll talk about uh, Halo and Galaxy spin alignments with the cosmic web, which I did with uh, Reen, Elmo and Marius. And in the second part, I'd like to very briefly tell you about the recent results uh, we did on reconstructing large scale structures using neural nets with uh, Robert and Adi at the Technion where I'm a postdoc right now. So uh, you all know in, in the audience here that the uh, matter in the universe is not distributed uniformly, but in these very nice intricate structure known as the cosmic web. So you have very high density regions known as clusters or nodes, which are interconnected by filaments. And there are large volumes in the universe which are devoid of uh, very few galaxies and also known as voids. And uh, what we will see today is how the different environments of this cosmic web uh, influence the spin and shape of halos and galaxies. So uh, this again was covered by Uri yesterday and I, I liked his animation a lot. And this is essentially the same thing. Just to uh, recap, uh, we have the initial, there is an over density and there is the uh, anisotropic collapse due to the tidal fields. And you have a collapse along one axis, you have a wall or a sheet, and then you have a collapse along the second axis, you have a filament, and then along the third axis, you form these nodes or clusters. And for our purposes, this collapse along the last axis is the E3 vector, which is what we will refer to as the filament direction in the stock. <clears throat> so the reason why I told you that is because the same tidal fields that are uh, collapsing these structures to form the cosmic web is also torquing up the halos and proto halos that are forming in these structures. So uh, very naively, if you, uh, if you have a halo or proto halo, which is non-spherical and the, uh, it has a certain uh, uh, inertia tensor, which is misaligned with the surrounding tidal field because of the anisotropy. And this misalignment gives a torque to the halo and it starts spinning up. So um, this is the reason why the, the same tidal fields that are causing these structures are also torquing up halos you would expect a correlation between the spin and shape and the, uh, of halo and galaxy and the underlying geometry of the cosmic web. Uh, so what we will address today is, does the cosmic web environment influence halo spin magnitude and orientation? And how does this alignment depend on filament properties? And there are also a lot of other things we did. How does these trends evolve with time? And what is the connection between the halo and galaxy? And how does these alignments differ when we have different galaxy morphologies and so on? But I will not get into that. And today we will just discuss these two. Uh, so this is showing the halo mass function uh, segregated into different cosmic web environments. So the black curve here is the halo mass function in the entire box, all the halos. And uh, the blue curve here is showing halos sitting in the filaments and the uh, uh, green here is showing the fill, uh, halos or clusters. I mean, halos growing in the cluster region. So you have only the massive ones. And in the void regions, you, uh, you don't have any massive halos at all. Already, when you look at the mass function, you see the segregation, the influence of the web on how the ha uh, halos are growing. And going to the magnitude, the spin magnitude, uh, that's measured in this uh, something called the lambda term, which is like the Peebles parameter or the Bullock's parameter. Um, and this is the distribution again of the magnitude of the halos, uh, the spin of the halos. The black is showing the spin of all the halos and the blue again is for filaments and voids and clusters and so on. So if you take the median of this distribution and uh, plot it as a function of redshift, uh, at redshift zero, you find that filament halos are spinning faster, at least the median of this distribution for the filaments is faster compared to halos and voids. And this difference is already seen early on at earlier redshifts. So this is likely an early effect and which you would expect because they are in different tidal environments. They, uh, they undergo different torquing because of the tidal fields. So you start seeing this effect early on. Uh, so there is, so two things to take away. One, the spin of halo magnitude is very small. And the halos in filamentary environments and this kind of tidal environments are spinning faster than in other web components, and it's likely an early effect. 
so how does it how does the halo spin orientation or the alignment change with the geometry of the web and for that we we first have to uh, detect the cosmic web from the simulation box and for this we used one method known as the nexus it's a method that's developed in uh, reens group in in Groningen. and uh, what this does is uh, it computes the uh, hessian of the density field on, on multiple scales and then it uh, computes the eigenvalues of this hessian looks at the conditions on the eigenvalues and then assigns a morphology to the structure and it's a multi-scale process you so you end up seeing these uh, cosmic web on all on all scales and the other method i will not get into the details but it just looks at the uh, same as the hessian but not of the density field but of the velocity potential and in one you're looking at the geometry and in the other you're looking at the flows so what happens when we apply these methods is this is showing the filaments in uh, the nexus plus and these are this is the filaments of the same slice using velocity shear method and in this method in both these methods you see these very main arteries of the web that are pervading throughout the simulation box but in nexus plus you also see these thinner and finer filaments which are not seen in the uh, velocity method. So eventually what we are uh, getting is these finer, thinner filaments in Nexus and more thick and robust, dynamically important filaments in the other method. And uh, how do we measure the alignment? This is fairly straightforward. So as I said, this is uh, the E3 is we would call the uh, uh, direction of the filament. And you have a halo and B that has an angular momentum vector. And the cosine between the uh, cosine of the angle between the two is how we would characterize the alignment. So a cosine closer to one is parallel, and a cosine closer to zero is perpendicular. And uh, I, I just wanted to tell that this is not only in simulations, and this these trends have also been seen in observations. But I won't get into the details, and but I'll be happy to chat about it in more detail during tea, maybe. Um, so yeah, so if you plot the distribution, so this is the uh, X axis is the cosine, so going from zero to one, and the Y axis is just showing the distribution. So if you have a uniform distribution, you would expect all the angles to be equally uh, probable. Uh, and that's how you would see if they are randomly aligned. But this panel is showing the alignment for low mass halos, about 10 to the power 10 solar mass halos. And you see an excess of cosine one, meaning that you have a tendency of low mass halos to spin along the filament rather than perpendicular and as you go to higher and higher masses you see just let's focus on the red line and the the red curve becomes an excess you you get an excess at cosine zero which means as you go to higher masses there's a tendency to for the halos to spin perpendicular to the filament axis so uh, we'll plot the median of these red curves as a function of halo mass to see this trend more clearly and this is what we see. So at 0.5, we say no uh, preferential alignment. And above 0.5, we say parallel. Below 0.5, we call it perpendicular. So for low mass halos, you see there is a preferential parallel alignment. And as you go to higher and higher masses, you see a preferential perpendicular alignment. And the mass at which this transition happens from parallel to perpendicular, it's known as the spin transition mass. And it's gaining a lot of popularity these days. Uh, and uh, that is uh, uh, dependent, I mean, not dependent, but it, is, it changes when you use different filament finders. It's not physical. This, this just happens because we are looking at different halo populations and we start seeing these differences. This becomes important because more, most recently there, there have been papers showing that this spin transition mass is sensitive to the presence of neutrinos and different dark energy models because the tidal torquing is different and so on. So if we have to use this as a probe, these kind of uh, little information becomes important. And that could be one of the reasons why in literature there is a, a varied transition mass measurements that people give. And it's probably simply because they're using different methods and populations and, and so on. Uh, so we saw how the magnitude and orientation is with respect to the web. So how does these uh, alignment trends change with filament properties? Uh, so this is showing the uh, mass fraction uh, in Eagle simulation. Again, the filaments, walls, voids, and uh, uh, nodes were classified using Nexus. 
so we find that 82% of all the galaxies are in filaments, 48% of all gas is in filaments, 52% of all dark matter in the box of, of eagle box is in, is in filaments. But the filaments themselves come in a wide variety of ways. Like you see here, you have very long and thick filaments, the, the tiny ones kind of isolated, short uh, and thin ones. One of the properties that we chose was the uh, filament thickness. And we wanted to see how the alignment trend changes with the thickness of the filament. So this is again showing the same thing, median of the cosine of the angle between the angular momentum vector and the uh, filament direction as a function of halo mass. And this is now segregated into halos that are growing in thin filaments and halos that are growing in thick filaments. Uh, so again, you see like the mass at which this transition happens varies over an order of magnitude by doing this segregation. And also, if you uh, choose a halo of mass 10 to the power 12, let's say a Milky Way mass halo, and if that is sitting in a thin filament, you would, you would see that it is like a perpendicular alignment with the filament, but the same halo sitting in a thick filament, you will find that it is a parallel alignment. So it's not only depends on the halo mass, but it also depends on the tidal field that it's subjected to, the kind of environment that it is growing in. Um, so yeah, even if you look at the, uh, the distribution of the halos in these thick filaments, they are in these very uh, clustered, clustered towards the node regions. And these are the uh, halos in the thin filaments, which are kind of in the periphery and all over the web. And you start seeing these differences on the way they acquire spin. Uh, we also looked at how these changes, we, all the, until now we were looking at how the entire halo changes. Now we see how the inner fractions of the halos change. And uh, uh, so this is for the entire fraction. We saw that uh, the uh, low masses and high masses, you see this very nice transition. But in the inner fractions, the green line here is showing the, uh, that the inner fractions are almost always perpendicular to the filament. They are not undergoing this kind of transition. So there are a few things to take away. One is this transition mass, the mass at which this goes from parallel to perpendicular is varying, is increasing with the thickness of the filament. And it not only depends on the mass, but also the type of filament. And the inner fractions are kind of perpendicular, but it's the outer regions that's undergoing this, this kind of a flip. So one of the things that we could think of that's happening is perhaps it's these late time anisotropic accretion that could be causing these uh, uh, trends. And we uh, thought that if you have a halo of a certain mass sitting in a thin filament, then this is guiding the flow of what is happening in the filament. So it'll accrete anisotropically and its spin won't change. Whereas if you have the halo of the same mass in a thick filament, then this is part of the flow in the filament. So there's like another big cluster where all of this is flowing. So if you look at it from the halo point of view, it is not accreting much along, along the filament, but perpendicular to the filament. And then it starts getting a parallel spin. This could be one of the mechanisms that the halo is getting this parallel spin. I tried to see that uh, by looking, by stacking thousand halos, uh, perpendicular halos and parallel halos, and try to look at the uh, velocity field as a heel picks projection. And this is the filament, uh, and this is the perpendicular to the filament. So I, I thought I would see some accretion happening there, but it's a very, very weak effect, and I couldn't see it. But any ideas on how I could see this anisotropic um, accretion on these ty two types of population, I'll be happy to hear uh, later on. Uh, okay, I'll skip this part and uh, with the galaxies. And yeah, and I will conclude here. I'll come back maybe to the conclusions, but I'll go to the next part very briefly in, uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, this, is, this has got to do with uh, reconstructing the large scale structures with using uh, neural networks. So Cullinan very nicely motivated why we need the maps and what we can do with the maps. So I don't need to talk about this part. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the, there are many problems when you have a galaxy redshift survey, you have the positions, but it's also the galaxies are a discrete sampling of the underlying dark matter field. And the, if we have a word cloud for this workshop, I think redshift space distortions would win the place and it would have the biggest uh, 
uh, uh, it would be the most used word here. So there are redshift space distortions, which again cause problems. And there are also gaps in the data, like you see here, it's the, um, the our own galaxy is obscuring and that's called the zone of avoidance. So in order to reconstruct the underlying dark matter and velocity field from these surveys, it's a difficult task. And Cullen already motivated why we, we should do that. <laughs> Uh, so there are a lot of methods so far uh, to do these reconstructions. One of them is called Wiener filter, which was talked about during the workshop. It's a linear reconstruction. And there are also a lot of other nonlinear methods, which I don't know much about, but uh, there are methods to do these reconstructions. But what we did is try to use a neural network. And uh, so reconstruct, if given a galaxy distribution, we want to reconstruct the underlying density and velocity fields. And in the process, we wanted to understand what the machine learning algorithm does. In some sense, if we can recreate whatever the machine does using known statistical techniques, then it's, we've kind of understood what the machine is doing. And we also wanted to recover the traditional Wiener filter from a neural network approach. So these are the things we wanted to do. Uh, so uh, this is showing just a simple network. You have an input layer, which is the distribution of galaxies. And the, this is the output layer, which tries to reconstruct. And the, each, the, the layer here will be written as a linear combination of all the input layers via some weights and biases. And you can also make this nonlinear by adding some activation and so on. Uh, so once you write the reconstructed layer, reconstruction as a linear combination of the observed field, what the network does, then we have to give a loss function. And we say that, okay, we have the true field, now uh, let's do a chi-square or the mean squared error between the, uh, the true field minus the re uh, reconstructed field, the whole squared. And we want the machine to minimize this distance and come up with a reconstructed field that's as close to the true field as possible. So what is happening when we do this? So if you differentiate this, take a functional derivative of this with respect to the weights, what we get is simply this. If this is a well-known result in machine learning that the reconstructed field using an MSE loss will simply be the mean posterior estimate. That is the mean of the true fields given the observed fields. That's, that's all the machine is doing. It's just getting calculating the mean posterior estimate. So you can come up with ways to do the calculate the mean posterior estimates with your own method, but the machine is doing very efficiently and elegantly. And if you use a, uh, so in, in Vena filtering too, uh, this was discussed and let me just tell you again, in, in a couple of sentences, what it is. In Wiener filtering too, what you're doing is you want to go from an observed, corrupted, noisy density field, observed galaxy density field, to the true field. And you assume a prior for the true fields. And you also write the reconstructed field as a linear combination of the observed field. It's exactly what we did in, in, with the neural networks. And then you calculate the uh, minimum uh, variance. You minimize the MSE. And then what you get is the Wiener filter. So there are two, uh, two things to take away. So one is if you have a neural network, like the one that I showed with just one input layer and one output layer, with just linear activation, nothing nonlinear going on, then it's exactly equivalent to a Wiener filter, given that the loss that you're using is an MSC loss. And if you have the field that is to be reconstructed is a Gaussian field, then both the Wiener filter and the neural network estimate is the mean posterior estimate, so they should match. So we checked that. So this is a Gaussian field with Gaussian noise, and this is the true field. And this is what the Wiener filter would give, and this is what the uh, neural network would give. They're very identical, and this is what you expect too. So that's, in some sense, we kind of understood what uh, a, Wiener, or, or a neural network does. And this, um, yeah, so Wiener filter and the neural network are minimum variance solutions. Given the same, uh, give the same result for the Gaussian fields. Uh, and this is just a point-to-point -point comparison of the true field and the uh, reconstructed fields from the uh, neural network and the Wiener filter. And this is showing the uh, neural network reconstructed field and the Wiener filter field for the Gaussian case, and they match pretty well. So that's one thing uh, we did. So to do this in 3D, uh, and we want to do it in, 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 for a bigger box and so on. So we have, a, we have this neural network, it's called an autoencoder, and it has a lot of convolutional layers. And I know a lot of people look at it as a black box, but 
it's just a box that you can open and see what's happening inside. And so we have a, a in, in input as a 3D galaxy uh, density field, and we want it to learn how to reproduce the underlying dark matter density field, true matter density field, and the true velocity field. So we train the network. Okay. Uh, we train the network um, uh, on MSE loss because we know that it's going to produce the mean posterior estimate, and this is what we get. So this is the observed field with RSD. And this is how the true field should look like. And this is the neural network output. And this is the uh, Wiener filter output. So um, as you can see, the nonlinear features are better captured with the neural network, which is expected because Wiener filter is a linear method and, and the neural network is a nonlinear uh, approach to this. And this is the loss function if somebody is interested to show that it has converged, uh, no problems there. And the uh, overall mean squared error of Wiener is always uh, of the neural network is always less than the um, neural uh, of uh, than the Wiener. So um, we, we, we feel it's a very nice method to reconstruct. And once we have trained the model, it's it's just a matter of seconds for for it to do the reconstruction. And uh, I think that's pretty uh, that's one of the advantages. And uh, this is again the point to point comparison. I'll, I'll skip this and just show you the power spectrum. So this is the observed power spectrum with RSD. So you see a slight increase in the amplitude. And the uh, black line here is the true field, the power spectrum of the true matter density field. And the green line here is the field reconstructed from a neural network. And the orange line here is the field reconstructed from a Wiener filter. So clearly on the large scales, as in the linear scales, both are doing a good job. Wiener filter does a great job when things are uh, linear. And in the nonlinear scales, the, uh, uh, the neural network does better than the, auto, uh, than the Wiener filter, which is again expected because it's a nonlinear mapping. So um, we also did velocity reconstructions, but maybe I won't get into that. <laughs> and uh, uh, so another caveat is if we, if we have the number density is very low, then again, the Wiener filter, and this is showing the uh, MSE, the, uh, the loss, which is the, the true minus the reconstructed, the mean of that, the whole square of that. So the Wiener filter and the neural network kind of plateau at very, very low number densities. So there is no point if you, if you have very low number densities, there's no point in using a heavy machinery like neural network to do it. You can just stick to a Wiener filter. But when you have good number densities, then reconstructing using a neural network is, is a good way to go about. So I, I'll stop here. I'm out of time. Oh, which conclusions? Thank you. Questions? A uh, very nice talk. Uh, so you showed um, that plot where you were using this linear network to reproduce Wiener filter, right? Uh, but you have to put in like some sort of a like a Gaussian prior or something there, right? I mean, uh, uh, to reproduce the Wiener filter. I think it, it came after this, right? Uh, this one. You mean the simple network, right? Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, you showed a comparison between just the lead, how you reproduced ah, yeah, like yeah, the Wiener yeah. okay, filters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In, you mean the Gaussian fields? Yes. This one? Yeah, 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 exactly. So these two yeah, plots. So Wiener filter works best when your prior is Gaussian. That's the. So, so you. Okay. Yes. So, uh, yeah, that was confusing. So, because like eventually, were you also putting in a prior or not? Like when you had the full. Nonlinear. Uh, so, for the full nonlinear method, the Wiener filter, we did it in a traditional way. We didn't use a neural network. No, but for the uh, neural network part, did you put in a prior on the? No, we don't put a prior. No, no assumption of a prior. We just train it on the uh, observed density field and the true underlying matter density field. Nothing else. Uh, Punya, uh, very interesting talk. So, um, is there an easy way to I, not a very to understand uh, why the transition in the spin alignment happens at a particular mass scale? 
Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I guess also alternatively, have you tried to track uh, for a single halo through its redshift, its alignment of the spin with the... So yeah, that is a difficult thing to do because like I, I said, this is a statistical effect. Mm -hmm. So it's not true that one halo, if you follow, it will become perpendicular or parallel or something. It's, it's a, if you have I a lot of halos, the probability average. that the low mass halos is more parallel is higher. This parallel is higher. So that's what it is. So it's a very statistical effect. And so I think following halo by halo is, it's going to give you a nice history for that particular halo, but I'm not sure if it will explain these trends. You will always have to do stacking and, and a lot of halos together to see what could be the general trend. Okay, thanks. Um, Might still work might be still worth trying. Actually. Yeah, th yeah, this is exactly what I was telling you about. Like we can have a, uh, two different samples which has already accreted and maybe still accreting and then look at how the alignments are, then maybe we can tell something about the mechanism. Um, I have a question regarding the Wiener filter. Yeah. So uh, I think you have uh, tried to denoise the data by the Wiener filter, I think. Right. You have some Gaussian observed, I mean, there is a true field and you have, have some Gaussian noise there and you are trying to filter that out, right? Yes, that's right. So what if, uh, so you have the covariance of the Gaussian, the, the information is there. What if I don't have the information of the covariance? Yeah, of... in, in Wiener filter, it's difficult. You have to assume, you need to know that beforehand. Okay. Yeah. So it's also difficult because even in the real universe, you need to know, you need to assume a power spectrum and then do Wiener filter. Otherwise, it's it gets it gets harder. Thanks. Okay. If there are no more questions, uh, we break here. Let's thanks all the speakers of the morning again.